If you use a smartphone and a computer, you generate a ton of data. Could some of it be crunched to help diagnose, predict, and even treat depression and other mental illnesses? These are early days, but let's find out about the promise of artificial intelligence and digital technology with Alison Darcy. She's founder and CEO of Wobot Labs and an adjunct professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. She joins us on the line from San Francisco, California. And here in our studio, David Greitzer, assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto and an attending psychiatrist at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And Erin Kelly is here, CEO of Advanced Symbolics, Inc., who memorably introduced us to her friend Polly, an artificial intelligence forecaster during the last Ontario election. And it's great to have you two here in our studio. And Allison, thanks for being there for us in California. I want to start just with a quote from the Harvard Business Review to get us off to the races here. Sheldon's back in the chair, if you wouldn't mind, sir. In a crisis that has become progressively dire over the past decade, digital solutions, many with artificial intelligence at their core, offer hope for reversing the decline in our mental wellness, New tools are being developed by tech companies and universities with potent diagnostic and treatment capabilities that can be used to serve large populations at reasonable costs. Let's go from there. Dr. Greitzer, to you first. How would you characterize the promise that artificial intelligence and digital solutions hold for mental health care? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do better. As you know, for every two people we treat with depression in Canada, one gets adequate care. It's a paper from the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. People face barriers, barriers in terms of diagnosis, barriers in terms of treatment. And there's hope that tapping into that data that we're generating with our phones, with our computers and our interactions, maybe we'll be able to get people help faster and better. Alison Darcy, what's your view? I agree with that. I, for us, it's, it's, and for me, it's really about access. You know, about 50% of the world's population right now does not have adequate access to basic health care. And mental health care is just not something that is available for, for huge populations. And about two thirds of people who have real symptoms and could really use with seeing a clinician will never get in front of one. So for us, um, AI and the promise of AI is about just increasing access and lowering the barriers to getting adequate care. Now, Aaron Kelly, last time you were here, you used Polly, your artificial intelligence, to sort of uh, help us understand what was going on uh, as it related to politics and election outcomes and that kind of thing. So what's, what is your connection to mental health care through artificial intelligence that you employ? Well, we were approached by the University of Ottawa back in 2016 by a researcher there who was looking to see if we could use AI to predict waves of suicides in the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started that research project with her going two years ago, two and a half years ago now. Um, and so I am very hopeful because we've seen now, af after uh, doing this, this research, that in fact we can use Polly for this purpose because Polly is there to detect and predict and prescribe changes in human behavior. So whether that's politics or mental health and suicide ideation, it's the same to her. Gotcha. All right, let's pick up with, in one study using the Facebook data of 638 participants, apparently they were able to predict future depression diagnoses as much as three months before it appeared in their medical records as a diagnosed condition. Again, David, how can social media be used to predict depression? This is early data, so we're going to take it with a grain of salt. But look, uh, you and I interact with this world so differently than we would have 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, and that generates data. So my posts on Twitter, pardon me, my posts on Facebook, my tweets on Twitter, maybe that's showing early signs of an emerging illness. Um, and maybe we can gather that information, information which, by the way, would be pretty invisible to providers like myself. So our doctors and nurses work hard, but we don't go through every tweet of every single patient. Maybe we could find that information and, and harness it with AI and, and come back with a diagnosis long before a person had even sat Let me in do a quick psychiatrist's office. Let me do a quick follow-up. Sure. GPS. Can you use GPS for the same way? I had a patient a few years ago, and a sign that he was getting ill was that his evening walks changed. He had bipolar affective disorder, and he was entering into a manic episode. He walked later at night, walked into unfamiliar areas. So his daughter, who was really on the ball, would give me a phone call. I'd have no other way of knowing. But, you know, his smartphone 
knew there was a change in his pattern because the smartphone has a GPS. Maybe in the future we can use that, and there are experiments like in Michigan with Priory, which is an app that looks at your GPS and looks for signs of emerging illness. It's hmm. exciting, hmm. but early. Early days. Aaron, what sort of data or linguistic clues is Polly looking at to help in discovering more on mental health? Well, the reason uh, there's so much promise in uh, for mental health in social data is because there's so much of it. And statistics works best when you have lots and lots of data. So if you're you know, looking at one patient, 10 patients, it's hard to, to find patterns and to find ways of detecting these things. But online, we have trillions of data points. So that's the first uh, thing I want to see. Um, say, what Polly does, she's looking not just at the individual. Here's the other great thing about social media. We can go back and look at the history of what people have said. So if we start to detect in 2019 that somebody is having mental health problems, maybe because their patterns have changed. Now, patterns changing could be a sign, but it could also just be, I mean, anybody who's had an adolescent knows that their sleeping patterns change. Mm -hmm. That could be a sign of problems, but it could also just be a healthy adolescent. Being able to go back then and say, are there other comor comorbid signs? Um, has this, do we see signs of substance abuse? Uh, is there a history of child abuse uh, in this person's history? Has a parent been laid off work? Or in the case of an older person, has there been a factory closing down? These types of things, together with um, the, the signs that we see at the individual level, because if we were just, just to chase around individuals, we'd have a high false positive rate. But when we can go back and see that history as well, that's what gives us the ability to really pinpoint things in a way that we weren't able to before. Allison, help us with this. I presume many people who suffer from depression know it. They already know they suffer from depression. They don't need an app to tell them that. So is, is there an important limit to how useful this technology really can be? Well, I think that it's useful to bear in mind that actually um, in a meta-analysis that was conducted, one of the most, I mean, the most predictive item of depression turns out to be the question, how depressed have you been in the last two weeks? So I do think it is where you can engage somebody's own self-reflection. Um, it's worthwhile doing that because it's about the person realizing themselves. However, um, not everybody has that kind of insight. And, and I think the promise of what um, we are speaking about today is that um, across problem areas, early detection is one of the most useful uh, methods for and, uh, you know, is predictive of getting people well earlier. So there is some value in early detection, but absolutely proceeding with caution, of course, um, is, is prudent. David, let's make the comparison as you might to a cardiologist sure. who has all sorts of tests and data that he or she can put a patient through to understand how to approach things. Uh, I guess up until now, you haven't had that kind of corollary data, but now maybe you do? Psychiatry is a world different than when I entered med school 23 years ago. We use different medications. I think we use them better. We're much more focused on short-term effective therapies. But when I meet with a new patient, when he or she sits in my office, the interview is very similar. I ask questions and he or she answers. There's a paucity of data. Let's contrast it with the way a cardiologist might work. God forbid you have chest pain. You go to the ED, they do blood work. You they go do to the ED? Emergency department. Emergency department, okay. Uh, as doctors thought, have to speak in a very complicated way. No, I got it, way, but I thought because of TV, we all call it the ER. <laughs> but anyway, that's another. Um, you go to the ER, uh, and, and they do blood work, and they do an EKG. They decide you should see a cardiologist. Maybe they do stress tests, some imaging. By the time you arrive in your cardiologist's office, there's a wealth of data available. That sort of data, to this point, hasn't been available in mental health. So we don't know about how your walking patterns have changed, how your speech patterns have changed, how your sleep patterns have changed. So on the diagnostic end, I think there's a lot of opportunity to gather data, but also on the treatment end, could we then take that information and deploy treatments in real time long before you thought maybe you even needed treatment? Follow up. Speech patterns changing, what does that mean? Somebody coming into a manic episode in terms of their bipolar affective disorder, they might speak more quickly. Somebody with a depressive episode might speak more slowly or might not be reaching out to friends and family the same way they used to. And again, if you're a clinician and you can reach family members, you would get that sort of information. 
But that information already exists. It's just that we haven't, till this point, been able to tap smartphones and, and other technologies. Aaron, can you imagine a time in the not too distant future where you are able to crunch this data and actually predict when somebody might be lost to suicide? Yes. And so what, what we're doing right now um, in our research is, see, what's hap what happens today is we have, say, a, s a wave of suicides in northern Quebec. The government then sends resources into northern Quebec. Mm -hmm. And what happens, they have to take those resources from somewhere else. So then we have, we take those resources from, say, Saskatchewan, and then we have a wave of suicides over there. What we want to do is get the resources to the place they need to be before the suicides happen. Mm. So that's the work we're doing now. Can we predict, and how far in advance, can we predict when there will be, again, it's a wave of suicides, population level, um, in communities that are at risk. Can we detect that, and can we get the resources there before the suicides happen so we prevent them? Hmm. Okay. Allison, we're going to put the uh, spotlight on you for a bit here because... We all know what a robot is, but you've developed something called a Wobot. And we've got a clip that we want to show just to introduce everybody to a Wobot. W-O-E-B-O-T. Stand by, everybody. Shelton, if you would, let's roll it. Every day he asks how your day is going, how you're feeling, and what you're up to. He builds an emotional model of you over time and can help you see patterns in your mood. As he learns about you, he'll teach you things like useful strategies and practical tools that have been shown to work. Okay, Allison, where did the idea of a Wobot come from? Well, actually, it just came from, um, I was, I was uh, at Stanford for, for many years, for almost 10 years, um, trying to, we were, we were designing treatments and, you know, evaluating them in, in NIH-funded treatment trials and conventional kind of research. Um, and just the realization that actually the mental health problem all around us um, was gr getting out of control in a very, you know, very quickly. Um, and the need to make something that was efficacious, but also highly engaged in the population to encourage people to really engage with mental health practices every single day. And so Wobot came from, from that endeavor. How effective is it at doing what it purports to do? Well, we actually conducted a randomized controlled trial at Stanford and uh, demonstrated that Wobot could um, significantly and meaningfully reduce symptoms of depression in just two weeks, actually, which is which is fairly quick. Um, we've also replicated that since with a larger sample size of, of 400 and, and showed that we can achieve um, about a 28% reduction in symptoms of depression and a 38% redux reduction in symptoms of anxiety over the course of, of four weeks. Um, so it's, it's fairly effective effective, actually. You know why it works? I think it's because it's integrated into everybody's um, daily lives. And that is something that hitherto has not really been possible. Um, and it's also something that you can reach out to in a moment of distress or a moment of need. Um, not extreme or acute distress, of course, but, you know, you've just had a fight with your, you know, with your husband or you, you're about to give a presentation at work and feeling really anxious about it. You can turn to Wobot and then Wobot can teach these evidence-based techniques based on cognitive behavioral therapy, but in the actual moment that it's useful. And we suspect that um, some of the, the great outcomes we're seeing is because of that kind of in-the-moment impact. Hmm. David, I would have thought if there's anything in this world that you can't replace the human touch with, uh, with a com computer or a chatbot or whatever you want to say, this would be it. Uh, so I'm interested in your view on uh, whether you think this is the real deal. Uh, I think there's something here. I think it's early data, and there is some data. What we're tapping is that there are evidence-based treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, which looks at how your thoughts influence your mood, influence your behavior, but we're doing it without a therapist. Mm -hmm. So I think for some people that'll be appropriate and reasonable. Uh, a lot of us do things through the phone. We don't necessarily need that human touch, but maybe some people do. So I don't think it's a panacea. I also think certain populations might work better with this. So for instance, some people who are autism spectrum, as an example, might feel better about the fact that there's no human connection. So, hmm. you know, when I look at these uh, early days and the experiment going on, I think these are different tools being put in the toolkit. And as everyone knows, you don't necessarily do use every tool in the toolkit to solve a problem. But they're good to have. But they're good they're to have. Good. Okay, Allison, in designing Wobot, did you want users to believe that the Wobot was 
sentient and, and human-like, or was there sort of never any question that, hey, this is a robot, but it can still be very helpful for you? No, absolutely. We we completely agree that there's there's you know there's no um, substitution for human connection, and so Wobot is intentionally a robot character, um, and he has a robot backstory with robot friends and what have you. And it's and it's a it's a fiction that people sort of buy into. He has a character with his own values, um, so that people um, sort of understand the approach that he's he's going to be taking um, to certain problems. Um, we felt that that's really important, and and most chatbot developers at this point. Um, um, don't pretend to be human. Um, I think if you look at sort of the really ubiquitous ones like Amazon Alexa and Google Home, you'll find that they're very open about the fact that they are just software. Um, and we feel like that's the most sort of transparent and honest way to proceed. If, however, Alison, I, I mean, I was going to say that the, the, maybe one of the biggest signs of the times in which we live is that the United Kingdom government has created a ministry responsible for loneliness. Yeah, correct. Uh, oh my goodness, I mean, can you imagine that even 10 years ago having happened? So loneliness and isolation is clearly being recognized as a potential public health issue. Do you, how, how deep is your confidence that chatbots can help with this at the end of the day? I think um, it's it's true that there isn't there is not one approach that works for everybody, and I think it's not necessarily you know the chatbot itself um, that conveys you know um, useful therapeutic value. Um, the fact that CBT and how well the chatbot is designed is really crucial. So we have almost 20 years now of data that shows that you can deliver a CBT without a therapist, and in in many cases um, without compromising outcomes. So in other in other words, a patient will do just as well with a self-directed version of CBT that they will, as well as they will with a therapist-delivered one. Um, I think what's interesting about a chatbot that is, um, you know, out in, amongst the population is that we're discovering the kinds of problems that people are dealing with in their everyday lives. And one of the things that was so surprising to us was how many people do actually report loneliness, even when they're in the context of a social situation. And I do think um, conversational agents, the, the beauty about them is just that there's no learning involved. There's no app that you have to sort of learn through. And it turns out when people are feeling badly, they talk about their problems. They don't click through them or swipe through them. Hmm. So it's a very natural way to interface with technology. But the actual principles behind it, the design principles, remain the same. And the, um, the efficacious um, value of the the, the techniques themselves, they still have to be really well designed and delivered. Now, in the midst of that answer, you could not see this, Allison. Uh, <laughs> David Greitzer was kind of, <clears throat> okay, Sheldon, put the camera on me for a second here. He was going like this, which I interpreted to mean, yeah, I kind of see what she's saying, but I'm not 100% with her. Am I right on that? Uh, I, I think you've interpreted well my-, my <laughs> Your body language? Uh, my body language, <laughs> be, be, better, than, better than, than perhaps an app. Um, look, I, I, again, I think these are early days and there's much potential here. I think it's also important in a Canadian context to remember how far we fall short in providing people with care. So for every 100 people who have depression in Canada, 13 will get some type of a psychotherapy. That's Payette's data from the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. So mm. if we can make therapies more accessible, particularly going past that bricks and mortars approach, I'm on side. Can we simply do away with therapists and get the same results? Yes and no. I think for some people, yes. Uh, I actually did the review paper for the Canadian Medical Association Journal three years ago, and we find, in fact, a very high dropout rate when we just tell people to go to a website. So again, I see this as a tool in the toolkit. I think this is a well-designed app that they've produced. There are other conversational agents that are well-designed, but I don't think this is a solution for our therapy needs across this great country. Gotcha. Let's, uh, I think it's time for another clip here. Tech sociologist, New York Times op-ed columnist, Zainab Tufetsky on the potential downside to predicting how we feel. Sheldon, the clip, please. What if the system that we do not understand was picking up that it's easier to sell Vegas tickets to people who are bipolar and about to enter the manic phase? Such people tend to become overspenders, compulsive gamblers. They could do this, and you'd have no clue that's what they were picking up on. I gave this example to a bunch of computer scientists once, 
And afterwards, one of them came up to me. He's troubled, and he said, "That's why I couldn't publish it." I was like, "Couldn't publish what?" He had tried to see whether you can indeed figure out the onset of mania from social media posts before clinical symptoms, and it had worked, and it had worked very well. Okay, Aaron, is there potential danger to having our mental states predicted by artificial intelligence? Uh, I think there's always potential danger and a potential upside to anything that you use,、um, but I think the upside in this case. Uh, offsets the negative side, and you can always deal with the negative side through policies and things like that. I think there's just so much tremendous upside to the work we're doing in、um, in reaching out to people who are suffering from mental health problems. I think the cases that、uh, Zainab is talking about are going to be remote, but of course, yes, they are always there. That people can take advantage of vulnerable people, and so the best way for me to guard against that is to be educated. To understand that there are people doing that out there, but I think I think the potential upside is just so strong from what we've seen that I wouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater. That's what I would say. Allison, what's your view on the upside versus the downside here? No,、oh, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think we have to. The, the difference here is is between passive detection and active detection of mood states. And so, active detection is is, for example, what we do, where we simply ask people, you know, how do you feel, right? And even and Wobot's really clear about this that if even if Wobot could detect your emotional state, he won't. He'll ask you because that moment of self reflection is is the key factor. Passive detection, on the other hand, is where people are detecting mood states, you know, without the person、um, actively. Providing any input and just you know processing somebody's data, I think that、uh, that is、uh, an area in which we need to be really cautious and thoughtful. And but I err on the side of transparency. And、um, you know if if people know about it and they、um, actively opt in, then I think that there's you know we we mitigate a lot of that danger. And、um, the danger, of course, when you're passively detecting mood states, is that you are detecting.、Uh, Potentially, a person in you know a, a state of emotional vulnerability, which can then be exploited. You know, this is sort of an advertisement, advertiser's dream. And、um, so, I think, yeah, we should proceed with caution. We should have the conversation, and we should just be letting people know and making sure、um, through regulation that、um, people must、um, opt in, much like Europe has done with GDPR regulation,、um, to allow their data to be used and processed in, in every specific way. David, where are you on that? I think we need to be very careful. I mean, there are tremendous ethical issues. So we want people to get help in a timely way. We don't want people to be exploited, and we don't want people to be exposed. So, for instance, people are going through some trouble, and they're putting information into an app that shouldn't be available to their employer, that shouldn't be available to an insurance company. We already have that problem. So, if you look at depression apps today, Shen did this paper a few years ago. There were more than 1,200 apps. If you go to the app store and type in depression,、uh, more than three quarters fail. A basic standard like a clear privacy policy. Okay, so three. Sorry, you said three quarters. Three in every four fall short.、Huh. Okay, so are there apps that are evidence-based that are providing timely information? Absolutely. Are there apps that touch on like her app, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is tremendously evidence-based? Absolutely. Are there apps filled with snake oils and bromides? Yep. So we also have to be careful that our agenda here, and I speak as as a provider, as a as a doctor, is going to be different than Wall Street's agenda or Bay Street's agenda. Apps are a good case in point. The metrics of Wall Street would be engageability, how many clicks they get, how long people spend on an app. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm interested in people getting evidence-based care, right? Right. So, and that's why, by the way, see the most successful mindfulness apps don't necessarily teach mindfulness that well. So, hold on. Lots of opportunities here, but lots of problems here as well. Aaron. Yeah, I'd like to say that we've already got a really good methodology, I think, in Canada for how to collect. Uh, health information statistics Canada does that without identifying individuals. So we wouldn't want to stop collecting information from the census. We tried that and didn't go over very well.、Um, you need that information for population health.、Um, so we have to be able to collect it in a way that is not personally identifiable. It is not. It is looking at regions. That's you know, for example, how we're doing.、It. We're looking at postal code regions and city regions, saying there's an. Issue in this region. Let's get resources there. Not there's an issue with Steve. Let's send someone to his house.、Hmm. Okay, so there's a big difference, and we're you know in that case you're 
you're actually going to be more accurate because you're looking at population level as opposed to one individual says, I've had a bad day and you're, you're driving to his house. When you see that there's a number of people in the community are having problems, that indicates that that could be real. There might have been a plant closure. It could be cyberbullying in the school. So you want to be doing it at, at that population level because you'll be a lot more accurate. You don't want to be targeting individuals. Um, and we do that today with, with statistics, data all over the world, mm. and it works well. Allison, when you were designing Wobot, did you take privacy concerns into concern? Absolutely. I mean, we are actually a bunch of clinicians and former researchers from Stanford, so we kind of live and breathe this stuff as well. But um, crucially, a product like this um, depends on trust. And so if you, you know, so we have hospital level encryption, we are HIPAA compliant, we are GDPR compliant, which is actually a very high standard. Um, and we, part of the reason for actually establishing Wobot was because we really believed that clinicians like us really need to start partnering with technologists to uh, make the these kinds of therapies that have demonstrated efficacy without a therapist more engaging. Because as Steve points out, you know, to date when um, people who have real symptoms are offered a website, they don't really stick to it. And it's because they haven't been built uh, to be designed to be very effective or engaging. Um, and so there's no reason why these two worlds can't come together. Um, but of course, it has to rest on the foundation of respect for people's privacy and, mm. and confidentiality. Allison, I've got 30 seconds left, and let me ask, uh, let me ask it to you. Uh, I think it could be argued that one of the reasons some people are suffering mental health problems in society today is that they're on their devices too damn much, and they have completely <laughs> forgot about the real world and are living in their devices. And there is an irony that one of the solutions to this comes from a device, as you have developed it. Uh, how, do you, how do you get around that irony? Totally agree. I mean, I think, again, the devil's in the details. Um, we don't do persuasive tech. Um, we don't try and optimize for keeping people in the conversation as long as possible. These are brief exposures, five to 10 minutes a day. And I think, um, you know, really responsible app developers should, should be designing things like this. Because at the end of the day, like processing your negative thinking is actually kind of challenging to do. It is not Candy Crush. It's not inherently, you know, going to be dopaminergic in that way. And um, so, um, it, you know, again, it just comes down to really good design. Who is the team building this app? You know, what are their core beliefs? And, um, you know, what is the structure that they have in place to, to, to really build a great um, experience? Terrific. That's Alison Darcy, CEO and founder of Wobot Labs. She's a psychologist at Stanford University. Alison, we thank you for being there for us on the line from San Francisco, California. Thank you. Aaron Kelly is here, the CEO of Advanced Symbolics, and David Greitzer, professor of psychiatry at U of T, attending psychiatrist at CAMH. Great to have you two alongside as well. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.